10 seconds. Hi, this is Dr. Scott Worden, the TOS guy from beautiful Sunnyvale, California, near the Big Apple Spaceship Campus. We're in a beautiful summer right now, and my summer is even better because we have an awesome guest today. Today, Dr. Yingwei Lum, who's an associate professor of surgery at Johns Hopkins Medical Center, a place where I did part of my training. Uh, Yingwei, great to see you. Thank you. Uh, today, you're going to talk about vascular forms of TOS? Correct. All right. I'm going to give the uh, floor to you. All right. Uh, thank you, Dr. Worden. Um, thanks for this opportunity to talk about thoracic outlet syndrome. Um, I know Dr. Worden has told me that the audience is a lot of, of lay people, but uh, I know probably some of you have done a lot of research and stuff like that. So I will try to talk down a bit, but not too much and still give you some of the medical stuff. In fact, a lot of the medical stuff uh, and try to just explain that in some layman's terms as well. All right, so tonight we're going to talk about venous and arterial thoracic outlet syndrome. I think this topic will probably take about 20 or 30 minutes for us to cover through. Uh, I'll go through some brief introductory remarks, and then we'll talk a little bit about some brief history. And I'd like to talk about the types of TOS, vascular TOS specifically, especially venous and arterial TOS. And I'm also going to emphasize a little bit on some of the common misconceptions. Actually, not misconceptions, but one misconception. All right. Uh, I always like to start a talk with uh, on thoracic outlet syndrome and ribs uh, with this picture. Uh, most people think that you know the rib that is involved in thoracic outlet syndrome is usually pretty big, and they are quite surprised sometimes when we've taken out the rib and how small it actually is. So it's not quite like this uh, tomahawk stick uh, on this picture over here. Uh, rather, what we're talking about is the thoracic outlet right underneath uh, the neck. Um, if you think of the collarbone like the roof. The rib as being the floor, and then the muscles are like the walls. And in this space, you have a vein, which is the blue, the artery in red, and the nerves that run from the neck to the arm. And as you can see over here, there are probably two areas that can get kinked. One is over here underneath the thoracic outlet, and one is behind the pec minor right there. Uh, for the purpose of tonight's talk, I'm really emphasizing only on the thoracic outlet, on the thoracic outlet over here, and mainly about compressions uh, that result in vascular pathology or problems to the vein or the artery. <clears throat> Again, similar pictures. Uh, this is uh, the right side, and you can imagine the uh, roof, like the collarbone, the floor being like the rib, and then muscles, which are the, the walls over here. So um, being at Johns Hopkins, I always like to try to uh, reflect some historical aspects of uh, TOS uh, to uh, Hopkins. Uh, Hop the uh, sorry, thoracic outlet syndrome has previously been known as cervical rib syndrome. Interestingly, now most TOS cases do not involve a cervical rib, uh, but initially it was thought to be uh, highly uh, you know, associated with cervical ribs. Uh, cervical ribs in general uh, have been known since about 100 to 200 AD by Galen, uh, a historical Greek uh, anatomist, and then by Vesalius, uh, who was a um, physician in the mid 15 or 1600s in Europe, who described uh, cervical ribs. Now, Dr. Halstead, who is this gentleman here in the top right corner, he was the first chief of surgery at Johns Hopkins, and he actually is credited with explaining how cervical ribs can cause subclavian artery aneurysms. Now, an aneurysm is a balloon dilation of the blood vessel. So a normal blood vessel looks like this. An aneurysm looks something larger like that. Uh, so Dr. Halstead, back in the late 1800s and early 1900s, uh, reviewed 716 cases of cervical ribs. And in, in his study, he found 4%, 27 of them with uh, aneurysms. Now, he did a bunch of experiments in actually dogs uh, where he took the aorta, which is the main blood pipe that leaves the heart to the rest of the body. And he induced stenosis, which is another fancy word for narrowing, by tying a suture around that vessel. And what happened was that he was able to show that as you narrow down the uh, narrowing of the vessel, uh, that induce higher speeds of flow just beyond the narrowing, just like how you would narrow the nozzle of a garden hose, the jet would speed up. And as a result of that jet and turbulence that speeds up beyond the narrowing, that causes balloon dilation of the artery just beyond the narrowing. So he was uh, credited with explaining how cervical ribs can cause subclavian artery aneurysms. <clears throat> Now, venous TOS, another fancy name for that, uh, and the eponym is Paget-Schroeder syndrome, 
uh, both were German and Australian, uh, sorry, German and Austrian surgeons um, in the 1800s and 1948 uh, era, who termed, um, uh, sorry, Paget and Schroeder were both Austrian and German surgeons in the late 1800s. And then Hughes was the one that coined the terms together in 1948. And basically, uh, it's another fancy word for venous thoracic outlet syndrome. That's also known as effort thrombosis sometimes. So we'll go through the types of TOS now. Um, as you, many of you probably know, neurogenic thoracic outlet syndrome, where it compresses the nerve, comprises about 95% of cases. Venous TOS is only about 3%, and then arterial types are only about 1% of all cases. Uh, neurogenic TOS uh, is not a topic that we're going to go through tonight. Um, we're going to focus on the vascular types. So basically, venous TOS is basically DVT, a deep vein thrombosis or blood clot in the vein, uh, just underneath a collarbone in the thoracic outlet. In the, in the thoracic outlet. And just like plumbing, when you narrow the blood vessel over here and it gets compressed, uh, that happens over a period of time. And uh, one day you get a big clot there. And then as a result, flow from the arm cannot drain back to the heart. So veins bring blood uh, from the fingertips all the way back to the heart. And since you're compressed right here, blood cannot effectively get back to the heart. And as a result, you get swelling, congestion, uh, discoloration, and possibly even pain. So a typical patient, oops, would present like this. And you can tell that right arm is a little bit more swollen than the left, more discolored than the left. So what do we do when someone has a uh, blood clot in the arm like that? Uh, well, it depends on the symptoms, uh, how bad the symptoms are and how long that clot has been. Quite frequently, I'm seeing patients who have had blood clots for three or four months or even five or six months that was undiagnosed. The uh, video of that clip that you just saw in the last slide was from a patient that had been diagnosed about five or six months without being on blood thinners. So sometimes people come into the emergency room and I see them right away. Sometimes they come into another hospital and been treated about two or three weeks ago and they're coming for a second opinion. So it really depends on how long they've had the clot and uh, what kind of symptoms they have at that point that this that determines uh, what kind of treatment we're going to offer them. But the main goal, main, the main form of treatment, at least at the minimum to begin with, is with blood thinners. Now, sometimes, depending on their symptoms and how long they've had symptoms for, uh, how long they've had the clots for, uh, they may not even need any surgeries or procedures. Uh, but some of the more common procedures that may be offered to a patient with venous TOS includes thrombolysis, which is a fancy word for evacuating and removing the clot uh, with a straw or a little suction device through the veins of the arm. So you're not really making a big incision. You're just going up with a little uh, bigger IV uh, and you try to suck out the clot that way. Sometimes that requires a stay in overnight in the ICU. Sometimes that can be done in one setting. Uh, so it really deter uh, is based on the technique that the surgeon or radiologist uh, employs. Now, another form of treatment for thoracic outlet syndrome of the, uh, involving the veins would be decompression because, as you know, that vein has been compressed and that was really the primary mechanism of how the clot formed in the first place. So if, it, if indicated, depending on the patient's symptom and duration of the clot, uh, we will offer them surgical decompression. There are many ways that we would do that, um, techniques at least, but the principle points are to remove the rib and remove the muscles that are compressing the vein in that location. Some people like to do paraclavicular incisions, which is a fancy word for uh, above and below the collarbone. Some people do infraclavicular incisions, where it's only from uh, below the collarbone. Uh, some, patient, uh, some doctors like to do the trans approach, which is through the armpits. And occasionally, some really skilled surgeons can do the supraclavicular approach and only a supraclavicular approach to remove the rib and decompress the, um, the subclavian vein uh, appropriately and sufficiently. <clears throat> now, after we remove the uh, rib, the next step is to decide how you want to repair the vein. 
I would say most pati uh, patients will end up get a, getting an endovascular approach, which is, again, going back in through the veins of the arm and trying to go up there with a balloon to open up the vein. And in some cases, open surgery as well. And I'll show you some of uh, some pictures soon. Um, at Hopkins, uh, our approach is to uh, take it out through the armpits, which is the trans approach, followed by endovascular angioplasty, where we go in the balloon and just balloon it up uh, the vein. And then in some cases, uh, we do an open reconstruction down the road, uh, only if necessary if the patients have lost symptoms. Um, so I'm going to show you more medical pictures from this point onwards in the talk. And in this case, uh, you have someone's arm up in the, um, in the retractor. And that's how we take the rib out through the trans approach. And after we've taken the rib out, typically we do this about two weeks after surgery. Uh, we do a venogram. And again, coming from the arm, you can kind of see the shadow of the collarbone over here. You can kind of see the outline of the chest wall. And this is the lungs. And you can see the outline of the heart. Usually, um, this is a straight path up and then straight down towards the heart. Uh, think of it as an I-95 and coming down to the, straight to the heart. In this case, you can see there's some sort of narrowing and some irregularities over up here. And there's more collateral veins, which uh, suggests blood is flowing through the route 1, route 40, and all sorts of different routes to get back. And um, that's how the flow goes. And what we do is try to cross that with, with a wire. We put up a balloon. We inflate the balloon, which then distends and stretches out the area of narrowing. And then we do another, and then we take the balloon out, and then we do a, uh, another angiogram to show the um, blockage is uh, less. Uh, it's never quite perfect, but it does not have to be perfect to give to give patients a good result. Uh, in my experience, I think a vein only needs to be about thirty or fifty percent open, and patients have almost no symptoms from that. Uh, here, are way more pictures, and I think you know I like to show different case examples of different pictures to just give patients an idea. Uh, this is one example where everything's like, like a little string down there where the channel's kind of pretty much a bit obli obliterated. But then with, success, with some luck, uh, we're able to get a wire across, balloon all that, and this is how it kind of looks like the end. Again, more examples. This is on the left side, some narrowings down there, lots of collateral flow, and this is how it looks like with a picture after the angioplasty is done. Uh, through the trans axillary approach, uh, we make the incision up in the armpits. Um, this is like post up day 10, and that discoloration is some glue over there that's still on it. Six months, I can't remember if this, I think it's a different patient. One year, and this is so one year. Um, some of the other approaches that I mentioned, Dr. Thompson at Wash U likes to do the periclavicular approach, and he gets a very nice exposure of the uh, rib and the veins. And uh, if, if indicated, he also likes to do the open venous repair at that time, in which case he opens up the vein, cuts out all the scar tissue, and then closes it up with a patch. And in some instances, uh, he may even need to do a bypass. So he would do a bypass from wherever it's blocked all the way up to the neck. And then some patients get the infraclavicular approach, which is just a uh, single incision underneath the, um, the collarbone to, to get out the rib. And then rarely, some people can get by with just a supraclavicular approach. But with that technique, you got to be really skilled in getting underneath the collarbone because the vein is really being compressed right in this junction over here. And sometimes it can be difficult to get the bone cutter all the way down to get adequate decompression that way from, from above the collarbone. So remember the case I showed you about just now, this patient? Well, this patient was a 48-year-old triathlete when I met her. She had five months of symptoms, uh, was actually untreated, and had actually been seen by a vascular surgeon. Um, what happened was I saw her. I gave her an, a blood, some blood thinners for about four weeks to see how her symptoms would uh, improve or change. Uh, and then we took her for surgery. We took a rib out. This is a picture of a rib. And you can tell that this part over here was extremely thickened. Uh, much more so than this area here, which is a bit more flat. This area is very, very thick. And that was probably what was compressing the vein. So we did the venogram uh, two weeks later, and this is how the um, vein looked like at that time. You can still see a little narrowing over there. We then did a balloon and kind of opened up quite nicely. Now, we follow patients up with ultrasounds, and this is just an example of the ultrasound uh, over here. This one end is the top part of the vein, and this is the bottom end of the vein. And you'll see color 
which is occupying about you know fifty percent to two thirds of the of the uh, of the channel. But then down here, you still have about a quarter to a third of the channel that's filled with just scar tissue. So how I like to explain this to patients is that imagine I-95 is all blocked up. All four or five lanes are all full of cars and traffic. You try to go in with a wire down the middle, and then you inflate your balloon and you kind of push all the wreckage to the side. And quite frequently, when you do the ultrasound and follow-up, you're still going to see some wreckage along the sides of the wall of the vein. Uh, and that's exactly what it's like in this situation. And that's her uh, competing in an, in an Ironman tournament uh, a couple of year, about a year later. These are just different pictures of different ribs that we've taken out uh, from different patients. Um, first rib, first rib, cervical rib with the first rib, uh, big cervical rib. I uh, sorry, big first rib, and this was a big cervical rib. So just different kind of ribs that we can take out through the armpits. And again, unlike the uh, Tomahawk steak on the first slide, this, these ribs are between, you know, three and four inches on average. In the past, we used to be able to give patients a rib. Uh, a lot of patients still ask me if they can take the rib home. Unfortunately, the, the policy at Hopkins is that now these things are considered medical waste. So uh, they have to go to the pathologist and they're stored in the hospital and they can no longer return the uh, ribs to the patient. So uh, patients now do not get the ribs, but the pathologist gets to keep a rack of bones in their office. All right, uh, moving along to arterial TOS. Now, arterial TOS is when you have compression in the thoracic outlet that results in objective damage to the subclavian artery. You need to have some physical form of damage, like in the form of an aneurysm or clot or something um, as a result of compression by the thoracic outlet. Now, simply the loss of just the pulse or discoloration with provocative maneuvers such as lifting your arms up or in, in different positions does not mean you have arterial TOS. So this is the area of the misconception that I want to uh, emphasize on. Because a lot of patients are told that they lose their pulse when they raise their arms up and automatically assume the worst that is arterial TOS or vascular TOS. But that does not mean you have arterial TOS because you may not necessarily have arterial damage. In fact, most patients who have this finding, uh, which is called the Adson's test, may not usually do not have damage to the artery. Uh, now, the way I interpret those tests is if you actually do compress your artery and you have some pain, numbness, tingling, which are uh, uh, symptoms of neurogenic TOS, the way I interpret the test is if the space is tight enough to compress your artery, it might be tight enough to compress your nerve and may help explain neurogenic TOS. But it does not mean you have arterial TOS. In fact, they've done many studies on this and about 11 to 40% of all people uh, may have some degree of abnormal compression of their pulse and they, are, they do not have TOS at all. In fact, they have no symptoms of TOS. So just because you compress your pulse your wrist does not mean you have TOS, a vascular TOS. All right, um, moving on to clinical presentation, people with arterial TOS, where you have physical damage to the artery, will have coolness, uh, pallor, which is just pale white, uh, discolor, pale white skin, uh, numbness or tingling, arm or forearm cramping. They won't have a, they sometimes may not even have a pulse at the wrist. Uh, the radial is the uh, artery on the, on the thumb side and ulnar arteries on the pinky side. Sometimes in more subtle uh, findings, you may have some splinter hemorrhages, which are these little lines on your nail or some nail bit changes before it actually sets down a big clot. What's happening is just like the nozzle of the garden hose, when you narrow it, the jet speeds up, it pounds on the artery, causes the artery to dilate, and then it pounds on it more, forms a couple of small pieces of uh, clot and things like that over there or, or damage. And those pieces are what's flicking down the from the from the thoracic outlet down to the hand and the fingers. That's what's causing um, all these symptoms. Now, I'll share with you that in very, very rare instances, you can get stroke symptoms as well. And I've seen about um, probably about half a dozen of these cases in, uh, so far in my career. Now, in arterial TOS, and I'll go through some uh, picture about how that can happen sometimes, but you know, it's just something to be aware of since it can be a very rare complication. Um, patients with TOS sometimes or frequently may have a history of a clavicle or collarbone fracture. They may even have a history of fracture of the first or second rib. Um, let me move 
this other way. And sometimes they have a history of a cervical rib. In fact, quite frequently, they may have a history of cervical ribs. Now, how do we manage patients with arterial TOS? In general, it's a little bit much more. It's a little bit more complicated than uh, the venous TOS. Uh, sometimes it requires stage or multiple procedures, depending on how you want to manage it. Um, again, some fancy terms you may encounter. You may, if you someone has arterial TOS, they may get thrombolysis, where someone tries to go in with a catheter from the groin, usually um, going all the way up to the arm and the thoracic outlet, and then down the uh, arm, uh, down the upper extremity and uh, put that straw or catheter there to try to suck out the clot. Uh, sometimes they may get what we call an open surgical embolectomy where the surgeon may make a decision in the uh, chest or the arm or the uh, elbow area to try to get into the artery and kind of open up and pull out some of the clots. That takes out care of the blood clots. And then that you require surgical decompression after that where we have to take out the rib, the first rib or the cervical rib. And very frequently it's going to be associated with a cervical rib and take that out to decompress the, the uh, underlying reason for causing the aneurysm. And then you have to talk about some form of vascular reconstruction. Uh, quite frequently, you may have to tie off and cut out the aneurysm and do a bypass. Um, and then again, with the bypass, there are many ways of doing that. You can use different conduits. You can use um, like the Gore-Tex material. You can use Dacron, which is a polyester weave. You can use a vein that's harvested from a cadaver. And uh, some instances, you can use vein from your own body as well. Uh, this was a patient that we took care of a couple, um, probably a year or two ago. This is the thoracic outlet area. You can't really see the cervical rib that well underneath, but the cervical rib fuses with the first rib right there. And then you can see the aneurysm in this CT scan, this uh, 3D, three-dimensional reconstruction of the CT scan, where the artery comes down, it dilates up a little bit, and it wasn't actually that big. And then it comes back normal again. And in her case, what happened was because of the impingement here, she had a clot there. The clot actually went backwards and then up what we call the vertebral artery. So usually patients that I've seen for stroke would have uh, strokes to the back part of the brain. So the vertebral artery goes up the spine, goes into the skull, and then joins up into a common channel. And then usually supplies the, the back part of the brain associated with balance and vision and things like that. But in her case, she actually had a stroke all the way to the left side. So we think that a small piece of clot went all the way up to the left side. She was only 16 years old. Uh, and she had a lot of symptoms uh, as a result of this. Um, another interesting case, a 52-year-old man who had blood clots going down the left side of his arm. I put up this picture over here just because his rib over here, you can see this in the shadow. On the right side is this downgoing rib. On the left side, you can see this other funny shaped rib down there, which is a cervical rib, and that fused to the to the first rib underneath that. In this case, now uh, this is just a blow up of the of this extra cervical rib there, followed by the first rib, and then on the other side is the uh, the uh, cervical rib there, and his symptoms were on the left side. This is a three D reconstruction. How you see the aneurysm that forms right over there. And we took his rib out. Uh, so at another hospital facility, he underwent thrombolysis, which is where we, they, they put the catheter up from the groin and up into the artery to kind of dissolve the clot first. Uh, they actually made another incision at the elbow, uh, cut out, uh, uh, pull out the clot from the artery there. And in his case, because his arm was ischemic or didn't have blood flow for a significant amount of time, they had to do a fasciotomy where they made big incisions in the form to kind of release the uh, compartments in the arm so that there wouldn't be too much swelling. And then when he came to Hopkins, uh, we found that his blood vessels had all been open. Uh, kudos to the surgeons that, that took care of him. And his aneurysm was only 1.8 centimeters, uh, but we went ahead anyway to uh, take out his rib so as to not prevent, uh, so as to prevent this from happening again. This is the preoperative picture. This is how his um, rib looks like at the end once we cut all these things out. And another case, 50-year-old woman that I took care of a couple of years ago that presented with some stroke symptoms, as I said, in the back part of the brain. Uh, she had clot right there. You can see the clot over there. Uh, and you can see the cervical rib right there too, where it fuses with the first rib. Took the um, rib out. Um, 
This is how the artery looks like once we open up the artery, the aneurysm. This is the clot within the uh, artery. And other interesting arterial cases, rib, the damage to the artery, which is filleted open. Another ginormous rib complex that we have to take out. This is probably one of the more dramatic cases I've ever taken care of. A 29-year-old gentleman at that time with a cool arm, pale hands, used hand warmers all the time, even this summer. And he had been treated for Raynaud's. His diagnosis, standing diagnosis of Raynaud's on just the left arm. Uh, the biggest hint is Raynaud's is never in just one extremity. If it's someone's getting treated for Raynaud's on one extremity, it's probably something else. In this case, you can see some irregularities over here. And then not much flow. Not much flow down the rest of the arm. Just to give you an idea, uh, this is how a normal artery should look like. It should be an I-95 all the way down to the elbow. And then the elbow is split into smaller branches, but still straight branches that go straight down. And in his case, this was how his hand looked like when we first saw him. Uh, we did surgery, um, took the rib out, first of all, then did the bypass to fix the aneurysm. We tried to pull the clot out, but it was too chronic. We had been going on for too long. We treated him some blood thinners and then did another angiogram. And at that time, this is my bypass that we have fixed up here. We had taken out the rib. And then it kind of still ended here. But then he developed some of some of the blood vessels kind of came back. And we had this. Uh, and this is the elbow. This is the armpit. You can see the chest wall coming down. And the elbow area, you can see the two, two small arteries going to the, to the forearm and the wrist. This is coming down. You can see the outline of his thumb and his fingers here. And a little bit of flow there, not much else going to the fingers. Um, and this is how it's supposed to look like. Straight down, and the elbow is split into slightly bigger branches like this one over here. And then in the hand, you're supposed to see more flow to the fingers and like the palmar arch and all that vessels. You don't really see much over there. But what we did was a bypass from his armpit uh, all the way to his elbow. And this is uh, his initial surgery. Uh, after surgery with still the stitches in place. And then he started working out over the next couple of months and years and he sent me some pictures of routine follow-up, uh, you know, as, as the years went on by. And as you can see down here, I thought I had, I had tunneled the bypass quite deep down, but turns out it was actually quite superficial as, as he started getting more and more lean over the years. And you can see the bypass in the end. And this was how his hands were before and this was how his hands were after. Still not quite perfect. You can see some discoloration in the tips of his fingers, but I think all that was as a result of the prior damage. But this was certainly one of the uh, most dramatic cases I've seen. So our experience at Hopkins, uh, I started doing TOS because my boss, Dr. Freischlapp, trained me at Hopkins. And when she left, uh, none of my partners wanted to do thoracic outlet syndrome stuff. So uh, I started doing more and more TOS and now currently do about 80 to 100 rib resections a year. Uh, all of which about 50 to 60% are neurogenic. Uh, we're quite conservative in who we choose to operate. Um, 30 to 40% of the cases I do are venous, and then 5 to 10% of the cases I do are for arterial TOS. Um, our team is quite um, broad and wide. You need a lot of people to help uh, coordinate everything. Lindsay is usually the first person that uh, patients will end up talking to with vascular TOS. Uh, Joanna, who's our triage nurse and also our administrator, sometimes fills in. Holly, who is our PA, uh, helps me with our, our TOS clinic. And Dr. Joseph White, who uh, joined us about a year and a half ago at Suburban Hospital, which is one of our satellite Hopkins Hospital, also does TOS. So some closing points. Uh, I think for venous TOS, it's important to know that uh, even if you have a blood clot, uh, you may not get diagnosed. In fact, many people, I think, still get uh, misdiagnosed and don't get the appropriate treatment done initially. But thankfully, you know, you're not going to die from this. Your arms are going to fall off, uh, but you are going to have potentially some swelling, discoloration, and discomfort. Some people are really not bothered by it, but those that are, the main purpose of treatment is to improve their quality of life. And if the vein is still somewhat open, reduce the chance of recurrent blood clots. Now for arterial TOS, uh, the purpose of treatment, again, is to improve their symptoms because quite frequently patients are quite debilitated by the lack of blood flow to the arm. 
And really the main thing over here is to reduce the risk of limb loss. You could lose your arm uh, as a result of arterial TOS. Now the treatment for these conditions, uh, there are many nuances to it, uh, for which a lot of it is more, more medical and technical. And we've not gone through uh, th those topics tonight. And it really depends on the clinical circumstance. So I think it's very important that you get evaluated by a surgeon that's experienced in treating TOS. And with that, I would take any questions. All right, that was really great. I really appreciate you taking the time to put that together and to share it with us. There's some great cases in there. Thank you. The, the last bypass you did through the forearm, that was really pretty dramatic. So Very interesting. So I'm guessing he had a, he had a cervical rib. We know that, and he had a blood clot form, and it traveled down the arm, and then it wasn't picked up in time. So then, when you tried to fix it, it was just too chronic to dissolve it. Is that fair? Correct. And quite frequently, patients get untreated for this for a long time. You know, they get misdiagnosed and get treated for different conditions. Right. In this example, brain arts, You know, for a whole year. Do you feel that compared to 10 years or 20 years ago that uh, the community, medical community in general, is recognizing TOS more? I think physical therapists recognize TOS the most. Um, I'm not sure if, you know, the general medical community is recognizing it more. Um, but, you know, I, I hope that now there's certainly much more outreach now, I think, you know, with websites such as yours. Uh, there are many other websites now. Um, out there focusing on TOS support. And I think, the, you know, patients are very much more aware. In fact, you know, sometimes I feel a lot of the patients know more about TOS than the physicians. Um, that's, that's great. I, I've said the same thing. You're making me laugh. I think physical therapists diagnose it more frequently. They put their hands on, they really pay attention, and they uh, understand the dynamic changes. So, uh, yeah, we, we feel our job here, a big part of our job is education. That's why it's so valuable when we have an expert like you come on and share your experience and your particular knowledge and approaches. And we hope that people who are watching, first of all, I'm going to remind all of you, click the like button because we need YouTube to recognize us and keep boosting us up to show us in other places. So hit the like button and subscribe. And when you subscribe, there's a little bell nearby. If you hit that bell, you'll be notified when we have a new uh, talk coming up. Um, so anyway, I, I took a bunch of notes. I'm going to ask you a few questions, and then we're going to take some from our audience. Uh, you had brought up history, which I think is really cool, the history of TOS. And um, before Halstead, the cervical rib was discovered because of Röntgen in Germany, who won a Nobel Prize for the first x-ray. So actually, first cases of TOS go back as far as 1818. And um, finally, in 1895, when Röntgen discovered, invented, devised a medical x-ray, people found these cervical ribs and called it, just as you said, a cervical rib syndrome. But then right away, you started getting patients with the exact same neurovascular syndrome, and they didn't have a cervical rib. So it became interesting very quickly. You mentioned ADSEN also. So ADSEN, the ADSEN's test, many of our patients have had it, where a doctor will hold on to your radial pulse of the wrist manipulate your head, your neck, and breathing, and see if he or she can make the pulse go away. And as Ying Wei was saying, just making the pulse go away does not make arterial TOS. But for some docs, and especially when Adson did this in the 1920s, he didn't have ultrasound or MRI. So it was his best guess, saying that, look, if the artery is compressed up here, then the nerves are probably compressed as well. And you uh, appropriately said that it's just a test, and it's only suggestive. Mm -hmm. So what tests, when you're examining a patient for neurogenic, for example, what are your favorite tests that lean you in the direction of the diagnosis? Uh, I like to follow the SVS guidelines and uh, the, the couple of tests I mentioned there, like the elevated arm stress test, the upper mm -hmm. limb tension test, you know, palpation of the scalene triangle. Uh, of course, the, we do the essence test as well. Uh, but those are kind of the main tests that I, that I try to do to evaluate TOS. And of course, you want to do some of the other compression tests for the ulnar nerve, for the median nerve, right. just to make sure that those are not the primary issue. So depending on where the patients have pain, you know, I tend to palpate those areas and try to figure out where, where, what, what the issue is as well. And it's interesting, your caseload is a much higher number of surgeries for venous and arterial TOS than the general population, right? 
Uh, I have to say, I mean, I'm a vascular surgeon, so I think vascular surgeons tend to do more uh, vascular TOS. And, you know, as you know, uh, not everyone with neurogenic TOS needs surgery. And, mm. uh, you know, we, we have, a more, you know, quite a uh, conservative approach to when we do surgery for neurogenic TOS. So that's probably why there's a larger percentage of uh, vascular TOS that we do. Um, yeah. Right. That's great. Um, so you have uh, 80 to 100 cases per year. Is that correct? Correct. We do about 80 to 100 cases a year. I still like to do all the other aspects of vascular surgery. So um, I limit myself to between five to seven new neurogenic patients a week, uh, mm -hmm. which is still quite a lot of patients. Um, and then, you know, the rest of my patients are all the other brain and butter vascular stuff. But anyone that has got vascular TOS, uh, be it arterial venous, you know, uh, we definitely try to bring them in sooner. Right. And by the way, your phone number to your office is on the banner at the bottom of the screen. Anybody viewing the video, if you want to reach out to Dr. Lum's office, that's the number. And they're happy to get you started in triage as to whether uh, you can be seen by our experienced expert. Um, I, I've seen it said by many of the people who do these surgeries that one of the most important things you can ask for in a surgeon is, do they have experience? There are people out there who do, you know, a few cases a year, but you do a lot of these. So uh, I think that's really important to emphasize for patients looking for a surgeon. Correct. And then, you know, I think uh, even though my number is there, you know, th there are many, many, many surgeons around the country that are very qualified to uh, do mm -hmm. uh, treat you. And sometimes Time is of the essence, and you right. you know should go get treated based on uh, whatever local expertise you may have. And there are actually many vascular surgeons around the country that have a lot of good experience in treating TOS. You don't have to come to Baltimore for this. Um, and you know just look up some of the Facebook support groups or the TOS aware awareness website. Um, this is actually uh, July is the first ever TOS awareness month, um, but. Um, you know, you check out those websites and they have a whole listing of surgeons that you can go to. Who who came up with TOS Awareness Month? That's interesting. Yeah, uh, it was someone that was treated by uh, Dr. Thompson at Wash U. And uh, I think she uh, made up a whole website and has been a real advocate for uh, for uh, TOS awareness. So yes. maybe she's to go a, back to your- a moderator of a large Facebook group, yes. Yeah. So to go back to your first question, you know, I think it's through all these resources that perhaps patients, I think, are more educated these days. Uh, hopefully that will spill over to physicians as well soon. I agree. It's fascinating, the history and how um, a lot of people deny the existence of TOS, particularly neurogenic TOS, which is just crazy, but it hurts patients. So having mentioned patients, we're going to start taking some questions from patients and see how many we can go through here. Herb, if you want to put up a few. Scott, should I minimize my screen so I can see the main screen now? Um, yeah, you can get rid of the presentation and stop sharing, and then you should be able to see what we're doing. Let me know when you see the uh, anyway, when you see the banner at the bottom. All right, got it. Good. So user paradoxical axiom says, Dr. Lum, thank you so much. Thanks from us too. Uh, what are your thoughts? On preemptive first rib resection, if venous compression is found on abduction on the contralateral side after a clot on the first side? That is a fantastic question. And I can't tell you how many patients uh, usually ask me this or they forget to ask me this. And then this is one of the first few things I bring up. Um, and I'll experience probably less than 10% of the time will patients have it on both sides, even though you may still have some venous compression on ultrasound in just those positional maneuvers. Again, remember 10 to 40, 10 to 40 percent of people with arterial compression with just maneuvers, and the vein being at the fulcrum of that, you know, the house is not like that. The roof and the floor are not straight. The roof and floor actually just you know, a little bit angulated, and the vein is right in this fulcrum right there. So I estimate more than 50% will probably have some degree of venous compression. So in general, I don't. I tell patients not to worry about the other side. Uh, my general approach in general is don't trouble trouble until trouble troubles you. Uh, <laughs> and you know, you know, you're not gonna die from the venous TOS if it does happen. And I think it's too aggressive to go in and just take the you know to preemptively take the rib out. I think it'd be different if you're going to 
the moon or to the Arctic Circle, and you're not going to be care for months or years. <laughs> but I, I would not recommend taking out the other side unless you had uh, symptoms. I can say that the imaging literature shows that there is frequent compression of the veins in yep. symptom-free normal people. Yep. A study done in the 80s with CAP scan at Northwestern showed that about 50% of people with no symptoms had yep. compression of the veins. And the other point you brought up, which is very good, is this is a very complex space. It's not just two boards angling together. The clavicle is curved. It rotates in three directions. And the rib is curved. And as you showed with your surgical specimens, ribs are many different sizes and shapes. This is part of my justification why I think imaging is really important to help make some of these decisions. Every patient is different. Um, oh, Dr. Werner, one more thing on the ad too. You know, as a radiologist, you know, a lot of the CAT scans are done with the arms up. And that's to uh, my presumption has always been that's to reduce radiation uh, so there's less penetration, you know, less stuff in the arm in the way. And as a result, that arms up maneuver, I think a lot of patients get uh, a radiology report that documents some degree of subclavian vessel compression with the arms up. And I think that sometimes leads to, you know, questions or concerns for TOS when it may not necessarily be the case. That's a great point. So if we're doing a CAT scan of the chest, let's say for entirely different reasons from arm pain, patients will typically have their arms put over their heads. The real technical reasons for it are one, you do reduce the radiation both to the arms and to the chest because you have to change the exposure, how much radiation you give for a denser body part. So if you get the arms out of the way, you need less radiation. And then it also causes what we call a beam hardening artifact. If you have more things that the x-rays have to cross to get to the receptor. So yes, arms are up. And yes, I see this all the time. I'm looking when I read a chest CT, I can see the thoracic outlet to some extent. Being that it occurs in, you know, maybe half of normal people, I never mention mm -hmm. compression of the veins. And I think that's probably an important point you're bringing up. If radiologist mentions it all the time, it becomes kind of a useless mm -hmm. point. You're just seeing it in everybody. What do you do with it? So I think that's a great point. Um, next question is from Squashed Mike. And before we answer this, uh, again, I want to remind our viewers, uh, we can't answer and we shouldn't answer specific medical cases or questions through this forum. Reach out to us. Uh, you can find my website, tosmri.com. You can contact us and we're glad to talk with you about it. You can set up a consult with me or we can get you to experts like Dr. Lum. Okay, so having said that, we can talk in generalities about these questions. So let's go back to Squashed Mike's question. I know it's several parts. I will get my question in now. He wants to be first in line. This is good. Everybody's motivated with TOS. I have venous TOS. Initial event in January this year in Central Europe. Had thrombolysis. Got back home to New Zealand. Got muck <laughs> mucked around. I like that term. Even in private medical uh, couldn't see a specialist for over a month. Then you had another scan that showed reocclusion, and you didn't get results of that scan for a long time, so it was sitting there. And now you've been told that surgery is pointless, collateral flow is present, anticoagulants for the next six months. Okay, um, so apparently you know, he's, he was diagnosed. He's had recurrent clots. Uh, the, the system has taken a long time to diagnose this. What do you think in general? If you're at eight weeks out from a blood clot being there and you have collaterals, are the odds good to do thrombolysis? Uh, so it depends. So I, I think you know this is where we get to the nuances of how to treat TOS in in the circumstance that you're in. And first of all, I'm sorry you have you know um, feel that you've been mucked around and all that. This is not an uncommon um, uncommon fe uh, feeling that you can get. Um. I think it really depends on how much your symptom, how bad your symptoms are now. If your symptoms are not too bad and you feel that you are fine living with the symptoms that you have, I don't think you necessarily need surgery unless your symptoms are really bad and debilitating and impacting your quality of life. Uh, because I think uh, you, what you've been told is somewhat correct. Uh, there's a lot of collateral flow. Uh, just like I-95 is clogged up, your body has found root one, root 40 and stuff like that is getting blood back to the heart that clot is now quite probably firmly scarred in 
and it's unlikely to move or embolize towards your uh, to your lungs anymore. So I don't think you have to worry about risk of pulmonary embolism and stuff like that. Uh, blood thinness for six months, you know, people usually tend to do three to six months if it's really bad or if you have pulmonary embolus, uh, people tend to lean towards six months. So that's kind of consistent with what you know most people would do. If you have a lot of symptoms, then you can talk into uh, what your treatment options are. And sometimes people believe even in this situation, there's some worth or value in taking out the residual rib because that can also still improve some of your collateral flows. Now, if taking out rib is not sufficient, our approach typically is then to uh, uh, consider bypass down the road. Or uh, Dr. Thompson, I mentioned at WashU, his approach in your case, I think would probably be just to go straight to rib resection and the bypass at the same time. So many different ways of treating this problem. A lot of it depends on how bad your symptoms are at this point. Uh, thrombolysis, I'm not sure if there's much value in doing thrombolysis at this point. Uh, you can give it a shot, but I, I doubt it's going to work, especially if with extrinsic comp compression and if your clot is pretty long. Thank you. That, that may be a situation, Mike, where uh, imaging can show really what's happening in the thoracic outlet. Mm -hmm. Is the subclavius tendon, is the costoclavicular ligament, the clavicle, are they compressing that rib, I'm sorry, compressing the subclavian vein severely? or not? Are there lots of collaterals? Um, ultrasound may also help with that. I'll just raise the point as a radiologist, ultrasound uh, is blocked by bone, so it can't really see the space between the collarbone and the rib, but it can measure the velocity of blood flow and the shape of the blood flow uh, with your arms in different positions. And for that, it's really valuable. I'm sure Dr. Lum uses that a lot, as well as looking at the, the width of the uh, vein. Um, you know, it's interesting you brought up um, the blood clot to the lung. Uh, it's a low risk mm -hmm. with upper extremity thrombus as compared to lower extremity. Mm -hmm. um, people may have heard of the syndrome where somebody's on an airplane for a transcontinental or transoceanic trip. They get a blood clot in their leg and it can break off and go to the lung, which is a serious situation. But for some reason, it doesn't happen nearly as often with the upper extremity, right? Uh, you know, I've taken care of many patients with pulmonary emboli. You know, I think maybe the size of the vein is a little bit smaller mm -hmm. and the impact is not as severe. Uh, but in a lot of patients who get CAT scans for venous TOS, they you know end up being found to have incidental PEs. Mm -hmm. uh, I would say it's probably about 10% of all venous patients end up with a PE mm -hmm. in some form. Um, so about 10% of the venous TOS cases I see have PEs as well. And you also brought up the case of stroke, which is not from a venous uh, no. TOS, it's from arterial. There was a famous baseball pitcher named J.R. Richard. He passed away a couple of years ago, but he had an amazing start to his career, pitched for the Houston Astros. And then he started complaining that he had a dead arm. And people just said, well, just tough it out. And then he had a stroke. It's just one of those unfortunate things. And he never, yeah, he never recovered his career. Really kind of sad. Um, thanks, Mike. All right, Herb, who's our next question? Kaylee, how would treatment plan change with a patient with Ehlers-Danlos? Um, so for neurogenic TOS, we're a lot more conservative with someone with hypermobile EDS. Uh, but with the vascular types of TOS, uh, if it's arterial, I don't think it changes things that much. I think you still have to do what you need to do to... Uh, to, you know, to treat it that way because you're otherwise risking limb loss. Um, with venous TOS, you can be a little bit more conservative. Uh, so again, depends on uh, what the patient's symptoms are and things like that. And it kind of links in down to a question that uh, James Shepard has, you know, because it depends on what, what, once the vein is open, depends on the status of the vein. Let's assume that someone actually gets thrombolysis and the vein is way open, uh, the risk of a recurrent DVT, if you would just leave it alone at that point in time, based on historical studies, range between 20 and 40%. And those were out of the uh, series from UCLA, where they used to wait, I believe, three or six months before they would do surgery from the initial blood clot. And while they were on blood thinners, there was a 20 to 40%, uh, 20 or 30% uh, rate of uh, recurrent DVT where they would reclot. And those patients are also on blood thinners. So who knows what the real rate is without blood thinners, you know, but I don't think it's more than 50%. Um, but still, 
you know, even if you talk about 30% risk, there's a one in three chance. And some people are willing to roll the dice. I think it's reasonable depending on what your risk tolerance is. But, you know, if I told you there's a one in three chance you win the lottery, you know, I think you might put all your whole life savings into that. So it really depends on your perspective. But uh, to James Shepard's question, one in three chance I see it on average. We could pull that question up next because yep. it's a multi-part question here. And there it is, James. Uh, hi, Dr. Lum. For venous patients with clear subclavian vein compression who do not undergo first rib resection, will there always be risk of thrombosis? And that we've kind of talked about. It's not just compression of the vein. And is it true that the body compensates over time with other veins taking up the workload? So, uh, James, I guess you're talking about collaterals. Yeah, I think for the first part, I think like what Dr. Worthen just mentioned, it's important that it's just not vein compression alone, but vein compression that result in venous TUS as defined by an actual blood clot. And then they do not undergo first rib section. The chance of thrombosis is, I would say, up to about 30%, 30 or 40% at the most. And if then they the, if they get the first blood clot. Correct. And then after that, if it clears and all the channel is reopens up a little bit and it's not occlusive, I think about up to a 30 or 40%. So not 100%, but you know, not, mm -hmm. not, not zero either. But we do know that there are many people, normal people out there get compression of their veins mm -hmm. and don't get a blood clot. Exactly. Correct. Yeah. So we don't know what that extra factor is right now. I Correct. know people have looked for hypercoagulable blood, but mm -hmm. I don't think we know the answer to why some people get the damage to the vein, the endothelial damage. Yep. Um, interestingly, you mentioned Paget, Sir James Paget, very famous father of modern pathology, I think. And uh, in 18... Uh, 75, he was the first to describe a case of venous TOS with a blood clot. And von Schroeder, who was in Vienna, um, he d discovered it at the same time, but he didn't publish it until nine years later. So that's why they get both their names on it. It's it's interesting. Um, and interesting, in 1939, um, McCleary syndrome was first mm -hmm. described. These are people who get intermittent occlusion of the subclavian vein, and um, but it wasn't described by McCleary. It was actually a guy named Charles McLaughlin, 1939. And in 1951, McCleary studied several of these cases, and he got his name attached to it. So I think a lot of doctors want to have their name attached to some kind of syndrome. But um, it's partly political, I guess, right? Yep. All right. Herb, do we have more questions from I viewers? Guess James had the second part of his question, you know, about uh, whether the other veins compensate. And just like, you know, the I-95 analogy your, your traffic will get to where it needs to go it may just take longer and slower and as a result you may have some swelling or discomfort and sometimes one of the uh, you know some patients can manage their symptoms by uh, wearing a compression sleeve and that might be enough to take mm -hmm. care of the symptoms especially when you're working out or things like that <clears throat> but again the important thing is that once you form blood clot it means the lining of the vein has been damaged mm -hmm. and there's a risk for occurrence mm -hmm. so Great. The way you described it, it's great. Uh, paradoxical axiom. Dr. Lum, uh, what's your favorite surgical approach and why? And I think you described the transaxillary. Yeah, transaxillary approach is my favorite approach. Um, I, that's just how I was taught. I was trained that way. And, you know, I've done a lot of it that way. And I, to me, that's the easiest and the slickest that way. Uh, for example, Dr. Donahue, Dr. Thompson, um, they are very slick doing it the supraclavicular way. I can do it that way too, but I'm not as slick as them doing the approach. And, you know, some people use a robot that was very slick that way. So it really doesn't matter in my opinion. I think as long as they have a lot of experience treating it, it's all the same way of taking the rib out, you know, it just a matter of preference of how, how you take it out. Do you also approach neurogenic TOS for those cases you operate on through the transaxillary approach? Yeah, I do the transaxillary approach for that too. The only ones I do supraclavicular or paraclavicular is when you have to do some sort of vein or vascular reconstruction. Got it. Thank you. Marina says, could you confirm that venous TOS is only with a DVT? So below wouldn't be a venous TOS diagnosis, marked right and moderate left extrinsic compression of subclavian veins on hyperabduction without distension or thrombosis. So uh, it's, this actually sounds like one of my reports. When I describe uh, our cases that we see we do our MRI on, I always uh, describe in some detail the veins, uh, where they're compressed, 
whether there's signs of distension of other veins because we're talking about collaterals. So as an example, if you have a pretty compressed subclavian vein, we can find veins like the axillary vein or the cephalic vein. Have those also changed in size, which suggests that the blood flow is not getting back to the heart as it should. So that's a, I'm expanding her question. But she's asking again, do you need the blood clot to define it as venous TOS? The only instance that you do not need it is in the syndrome that you just mentioned prior to this, McClary syndrome. And what happens in that syndrome is that the veins are getting squished. And I believe the pathophysiology of that is that as the vein gets them squashed repeatedly over time, there's already some web or some sort of synechia or something on, in the inside of the vein that doesn't cause a, a complete occlusion and blood clot, but patients will have some symptomatic swelling of the arm. But then when they do the ultrasound and a proper sonographer takes a really good look behind the collarbone area, which can be difficult to image and there's no clot. In that instance, maybe you may still have the early signs of venous TOS. So I think McClary syndrome is probably the exception where you do not have a blood clot, but you probably have some degree of endothelial or intimal damage on the inside as a result of that chronic compression. Uh, but you must have symptoms in that situation. So, and the symptoms, not numbness, tingling is, I think I, sh you know, I, to me it would be swelling or some for, sort of intermittent, intermittent venous congestion. Very good. And you had briefly mentioned Raynaud syndrome before, uh, which is uh, probably mediated by the sympathetic nervous system, the autonomic nervous system, and the hands change color. Patients describe pale hands and blue hands and red hands. Mm -hmm. And uh, as you said, it's bilateral. It's not unilateral. So mm -hmm. venous TOS is almost always a unilateral presentation. So those color changes, like that nice case you showed with the, the triathlete with the, the red um, almost cyanotic arm it was red to purple and the swelling. That was a great example. Mm -hmm. uh, Christopher, my right hand falls asleep. If I sleep on my right side at night, I am fit and strong, but it's getting worse over the months. I can't sleep on my right side anymore. It is related to a click in my shoulder. Um, just a, a side note, there was, I think it was Todd in 1912. He believed that it was arm positioning during sleep that caused TOS. And so he slept with his arm over his head for like seven years and it took like seven years and then he got a blood clot. That's not instructive of anything in particular, but I'll pass this to you. Uh, anyway, what do you suggest he does uh, next? What kind of tests or evaluation? Hard to say. I think you should see a doctor, you know, that can evaluate you with an ultrasound or get an MRI or something. It's really hard to say with just, you know, um, you know, a couple of sentences on the, on the chat forum like that. But if it's any reassurance, my arm falls asleep, I sleep like that. But I understand you are saying you fall asleep when you sleep on your right side. So the thoracic outlet, as Dr. Worden mentions, you know, very dynamic and you can get compressions in different ways. And, you know, I'm not sure how you're leaning or how hard you're, you know, you're, what the situation is, your bed, the pillows, who knows? You can certainly be compressing your thoracic outlet a, a little bit. But if you're not having symptoms of, you know, what we talked about, discoloration, congestion, you know, your pulse is there, chances are it's not venous TOS. You may be getting some intermittent compression of the uh, nerve. And, you know, like a lot of people get numb with their arms up like that. That's, that, that can be normal. That, in fact, that's, that is normal. Um, it's only when you have more long-lasting effects when you're doing stuff at normal height and level, that's when, when, when it may be more abnormal. If it's positional, uh, Christopher, yeah, you should have a doc do a hands-on examination, try to reproduce it. Mm -hmm. Danny Davis, hi. Uh, why does TOS cause the shoulders to roll forward and then subsequently cause the upper trap and the upper back pain? Um, I think this, you're probably referring more to neurogenic symptoms or some of the neurogenic uh, postures that can happen. I'll be the first one to tell you, neurogenic TOS is a syndrome because there are a lot of things that people do not understand why. I'm the first one to tell you, I do not know everything about neurogenic TOS. Uh, but I would tell you that, you know, patients with pain or in your circumstance, what you describe, who knows if your postural 
um, you know, predisposition is what caused your TOS to begin with, or if the TOS pain and symptoms and discomfort is what causes you to roll your shoulders forward. So it's hard for me to tell you, you know, with a straight answer, what's what, you know, I, I, I don't think anyone may be able to tell you unless they examine you and get a more thorough history about what you're going through. Um, so it's a little bit challenging to give you a straight answer for this. It, I know in some patients it does suggest they're uh, guarding. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, if you have pain with your, when your normal posture, some patients will intentionally just roll that forward because it may be relieving pressure on the brachial plexus by repositioning the mm -hmm. collarbone. We have no imaging proof of that. No one's imaged somebody doing that, but it, it's just kind of a guess. The, um, the, the muscles, of course, are going to get tight if you're always using them. If you always have to hold yourself like this to relieve pain, then the muscles are just going to get tight over time, I believe. And, uh, you know, many people believe that your posture changes is what I've heard physical therapists say, that your spine posture, the way you stand changes because you're changing your center of gravity. So it has a lot of knock-on effects. So that's definitely something you want to be evaluated by somebody who knows TOS mm -hmm. and do some of that positional provocative testing as Dr. Lum was talking about. Uh, Benjamin Butler, thanks for the talk. Thank you. Um, thanks for coming and viewing. Is a surgical approach appropriate if there is CRPS and TOS pre-surgical if the conservative approach fails? So um, how do you address somebody if you're trying to distinguish CRPS from TOS? Um, I'm presuming you're, you're referring to more neurogenic symptoms in this case yep. and not the vascular types. Um, CRPS, uh, sorry, doing surgery on someone with CRPS can make the symptoms worse. So it's not something that we jump to very lightly. Uh, so it depends on what conservative approaches you've done. Um, you know, we definitely will try all sorts of uh, scaling injections to different muscle groups, different scalings, anterior, middle, pec minor, depending on where your symptoms are. And then if you've done everything else, cupping, acupuncture, all that kind of stuff, worst resort, I guess, yes, I've done some cases of decompression. I don't recall at the top of my head how well all those patients did, but it's generally poorer than the average patient with neurogenic TOS. Yeah, CRPS is tough for a lot of people and for a lot of doctors. And, and, and exactly uh, what Dr. Lum is saying, you got to be careful before you plunge in with that. Benjamin says, do you see chronic neurogenic damage of C5 to C7 instead of C8 to T1 in neurogenic TOS? Um, I think what he's asking is the question of, you know, lower trunk versus upper trunk. I think a lot of TOS is described as lower trunk because of the cervical rib. But as you pointed out, you know, we see a lot of patients with neurogenic TOS without cervical ribs. Yeah, I think in this case, you know, I think you need to explore some of the other differential diagnosis. You know, there are many other things that can cause brachial plexitis, uh, some sort of Parsonage Turner syndrome thing. You know, there are many other things that can probably cause C5 to C7 damage instead of C8, T1. I mean, just knowing uh, the anatomy of the thoracic outlet, usually I would say if you're going to see some sort of MRI or e EMG findings of uh, nerve damage, it's usually going to be the lower trunk and the lower roots, in my experience. But, you know, of course, sometimes you may have some funny bands that are going around that's only compressing the upper trunks or upper roots, possible, but, you know, in general, it's a little bit less likely. Yeah, and EMG is tough to work with. It shows only the... 20% fastest nerve fibers. So you can have other nerve fibers that are damaged. It's just not sensitive. But there was a study in the 70s, I think, by Klein at LSU. I'll have to look it up, um, where intraoperatively they did EMGs on C8 and T1 and found clearly as they crossed a fibrous band mm -hmm. that there was an abnormality. Thanks, Benjamin. Laura Reed for... <laughs> Sorry, I know the talk is on vascular. We get a lot of questions about neurogenic. Um, for neurogenic TOS, how do you decide if and when to do surgery versus physical therapy? Uh, I always do physical therapy up front. Um, I never, very rarely do I jump straight to surgery. I think you should always do physical therapy up front because um, if PT can help you get better, why, why go through the trouble of taking a rib out? Surgery should always be the last resort. How long do you usually allow physical therapy to go before you reconsider 
the surgical option? Oh, I think a good two to three months on you know a proper TOS protocol, I think is reasonable. And then we would do scaling injections and all the other things first. Do you have a specific physical therapists you work with? Uh, no, we I actually do not have a specific therapist, but we have a bunch of instructions which is similar to our post-operative protocol that we give patients to. Post-operative, but how about in this situation where you're similar. deciding we, surgery? They, they just run through the similar protocol, but they can probably speed up faster than the post-op right. protocol. So the physical therapy program needs to be dedicated to neurogenic TOS. It can't just be a run-of-the-mill. We've got... Yeah, ideally, but you know, I think with some of the instructions that we give them, they can probably, you know, stumble across through or try different techniques. I feel that for physical therapy, there's so many online resources now that you know they can try. And I don't believe there's only one exercise or two exercises that are good for TOS. Um, you know, in terms of physical therapy, you know, different patients probably need different you know, different kinds of exercises to help alleviate the symptoms. So I don't think it's one specific protocol or one specific exercise that they need to do. And that's a, in my opinion, that's a great thought. There are people I know who've gone through physical therapy without much improvement mm -hmm. and then did a lot better with a different physical therapist with a different approach. Mm -hmm. So just like Dr. Lum is talking about different surgical approaches of the mm -hmm. different experts, including himself, there will be different physical therapists. And because the disease is heterogeneous or different types of it, there may be one form that works better than others. Mm -hmm. can, uh, the viewers can look up Steve Talakowski, who's given several talks here on our live streams, and he's talked about the edge law approach, but there are other approaches. Mm -hmm. And if you have questions about that, you can reach out to us and we can connect you with different physical therapists. All right. Thanks, Laura. Abraham Apple, can cervical ribs contribute to venous compression? Great question. Um, I've come across one case of that happening. It was a colleague that I know uh, that lives and works in Brazil now. And they sent me a picture in the films and it was truly a sub patient with a cervical rib that uh, had venous TOS. Now, I still, in general, I think cervical ribs protect you somewhat from venous TOS just because when you have the cervical rib, usually your first rib is gonna be a little bit lower and usually the cervical rib is not a complete rib that goes all the way to the front. So in my mind, I think of the first rib being lower on the sternum. And if you think of the floor being lower in the house and floor analogy, I think cervical ribs actually protect you from venous TOS. Not to wish anyone to have a cervical rib. You know, most patients with cervical ribs will live their lives without any symptoms. Right. Uh, but I, I, I don't think venous, I mean, cervical ribs in general predispose you to venous compression. And that's it's a great point. I've never heard you before. To arterial neogenic stuff, but I think it protects you somewhat if you, you know, want to look at it that way from venous TOS. So remember, uh, Abraham, the cervical rib is in the back. And the, the vein is the structure that's farthest to the front. Mm -hmm. So it would have to be a large cervical rib. And the point that Dr. Lum's making, which I never thought about before, is that's actually going to spare the space between the clavicle and the first rib and make it less likely, maybe, that the vein gets compressed. So maybe it was just coincidental that this case you saw had venous TOS mm -hmm. and a cervical rib. We don't know. Mm -hmm. That's a good question. Thanks, Abraham. Ravi. My symptoms are only during exertion. I'm going to remind you, we'll address this generally, but we can't be too specific. My symptoms only occur during exertion. Happens only in the left arm with discoloration, coldness in the left hand. And this happens within five minutes of walking inside the house and is very consistent. Can TOS happen only on exertion? Well, uh, one, of the names, think... one of the names for venous TOS, right? Yeah, I mean, we talked about McClary syndrome, you know, um, mm -hmm. It's possible it could be some venous, uh, early venous TOS is hard to know. Again, you know, you should get an ultrasound or see your doctor or something like that. Uh, I will tell you that from personal experience, when I used to be younger and had a bit more muscular weight from me and, you know, when I used to work out more and lift more weights, when I used to run, my hands would get numb. So um, who knows? It's hard to say. I think it's worth an ultrasound or some exploration, especially if this is bothering you a lot. The, one of the first names of TOS was effort thrombosis because it was noted in people who had exerted themselves. Mm 
Mm-hmm. So definitely if that's happening and it's unilateral, probably you should consider yeah. seeing somebody comfortable with TOS. Mm-hmm. By the way, the t- uh, some of the tests for that are very easy. Ultrasound is a great way to look for a blood clot, completely non-invasive, no mm-hmm. radiation. So if somebody looks carefully and they do an ultrasound with your arm in different positions, they can make a diagnosis pretty readily. All right, Brad. Hi, Brad. Good to see you again. Does vascular TOS cause arm sw- sweating and blueness? Uh, and then separate question, do you use ketamine as a surgical anesthetic? Um, to answer your first case, I guess vascular TOS, if it's venous, it can cause your arm to be swollen and cyanotic and blue. Um, I'm not sure about sweating, but, you know, usually you're in a state of discomfort and stuff like that. So uh, sweating in itself, I would not say it's a typical symptom of vascular TOS. But, um, and second question, do I use ketamine as surgical anesthetic? I, I personally don't use ketamine. You know, that's usually a medication that's administered by the anesthesiologist. So um, um, not something I have any comments or experience with. Thank you, Brad. Paradoxal axiom. Short question. Uh, something we talked about, the risk of PE and stroke from venous TOS. Well, <laughs> I think risk of PE is an easier answer. Uh, risk of PE, I would say, in, in with venous TOS, I think it's probably 10% or less. Um, I definitely see it you know, a couple of times a year, but usually the clots are somewhat small. I've not seen major or large clots before, uh, but always possible. Um, stroke, well, in order to get stroke from venous TOS, you also have to have a hole in your heart. So you would have to have, you know, and I think I can't remember what the number is, is for uh, small patent foramen oval, as you call it, PFOs. Um, I forget what the number is in the population. It's less than 1%, I think. Um, but but the problem there is that you'd have to have a blood clot go from the arm, right. to clavian vein, th- to the right heart, then through the patent foramen ovale into the left right. heart. Right? And usually the left heart pressure is higher than the right heart pressure. So that hole, even though it's open, it's got to go against that flow. So possible, I've not seen it yet, uh, but we definitely see what we call you know, paradoxical clots uh, with patients with DVT in the lower extremities that have embolized across. You know, I've definitely seen that uh, for lower extremity DVTs. Um, Which is really the same mechanism, right? The same mechanism, you know. So I've seen it before for lower extremity, but I've not seen it for venous TOS. Except the difference is that the blood clot, a fragment of it breaking off from the leg, is going to come up the inferior vena cava. Yep. As it enters the right atrium, it's actually pointed at yep. the interatrial septum where the per- patent foramen ovale could be, mm-hmm. whereas the upper extremity one would be heading down and away from it. Mm-hmm. Who knows? No one's yeah. actually filmed it and documented. With arterial TOS, even there, it's rare to get stroke, and that's because you get a blood clot. And the blood clot has to build up going backwards mm-hmm. against the arterial flow until it reaches the first branch, yep. uh, the vertebral artery, which arises from the subclavian, as yep. you mentioned. So it's rare. Very rare. Thanks for the question. Benjamin again. Hi, Benjamin. Any thoughts on wraps to protect the brachial plexus after surgical decompression? Great question. Um, I believe Dr. Thompson uses the uh, wraps a lot. Um, I personally don't use it that much unless uh, someone has a re- coming in for redo surgery. Um, that's when I would use the wraps because I think you know there's quite l- little risk in trying that. But typically, I believe there have been one or two studies that have shown that it makes no long-term difference. Uh, so I typically don't use those wraps, but it's not wrong to use it. And, it's, and, you know, and these, people- these studies are based on the pain analog, mm-hmm. the visual analog for pain. I, I, yeah, I, I can remember, or maybe some quality of life forms too. I, I, I don't recall specifically. Do you do neurolysis when you do neurogenic procedure? Yeah, through the armpits, I need, I can only get to the inferior trunk and the okay. inferior roots. So C and T1, I can get to. And those are the ones I focus on. Just make sure that those things are completely free and limited neurolysis. So they can glide easily and not trapped up with scarring or inflammation. Correct, correct. And uh, usually it's going to be more scaling muscle fibers that are in the way or inter- interdigitating it rather than mm-hmm. actual scar tissue, except for redo cases. Um, right. But if it's native, usually there's some scar tissue, but usually much less than the redo. Right. So we're, we're talking about 
redo for our viewers is when someone's already had thoracic Perfect. outlet decompression. Correct. Symptoms are still there, and now there's a bunch of scar tissue from the prior procedure you have to work with. Yep. Okay, thank you. Christoph, hi. Uh, I read an article where there is a calculator to predict TOS surgical approach. I haven't heard this. Um, Botox does lower the chance of positive outcome. Any ideas why? Is this a paper you've seen, uh, in a way? <laughs> where Or a calculator? It's, it's actually a paper that I wrote. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, so I think there was probably some selection bias in that. You know, I think I tend to steer people whom I don't think are great candidates for surgery to Botox. Um, but again, I'm also someone that also believes uh, that, you know, surgery should always be the last resort. So I tend to also naturally offer Botox to patients whom I also think are going to be great candidates anyway, because I truly believe, you know, there's always a 5 10% chance that Botox may give you long-lasting relief. The only problem is I do not know who that 5 or 10% are. Mm -hmm. And to me, I think that downs, you know, Botox has very little downsides, you know, um, and it's worth a, worth a shot, especially since surgery is not 100% guaranteed either. Um, I think it's worth a shot at Botox. But in the paper that we wrote, my suspicion is that, you know, even back, you know, when we collected those data in the past, I tend to steer uh, patients who do not, whom I think are going to be poor surgical outcomes to do more Botox and for more frequent, you know, more times before we go into surgery. Good point. Very good. Emily Hillary, uh, thanks for the ultrasound shout out. I feel we are a great asset for diagnosis. Yeah. Uh, I'm guessing you're a sonographer. All right. RVT here. Do you find both venous and arterial testing helpful for TOS evaluation? I have been duplexing both systems for my surgeon's protocol, and they find it helpful. And I've also scanned venous duplex for TOS, where there is no evidence of DOT, DVT. However, all the waveforms distal to the subclavian vein become continuous and lose their phasicity. It's a good, a good complex question. Thank you, Emily. Um, so yes, I, we use duplex a lot, tremendously. Uh, we are, I'm very close to all our sonographers at Hopkins, uh, and we actually have frequent lunch and learns and stuff, not just to discuss TOS stuff, but for everything. So I, I truly believe it's very important for vascular surgeons to have a good relationship with their sonographers. Um, so I think, you know, as Dr. Worden has mentioned, the area underneath the collarbone can be a really tough spot to visualize. And one of the things you touched on something I personally look for is whether there's phasic flow. And I, when you mean distal, I mean, you know, I presume you mean like the axillary and the, you know, um, distal subclavian vein, I guess, in this sense. But, you know, towards the arm or the armpits as opposed to central. I look for continuous flow there because to me, if there's continuous flow there, that suggests that you have a proximal occlusion somewhere up here. Uh, if you're not okay. seeing the subclavian, I've seen one or two cases where someone has got a very bad pectus deformity and it's kind of compressing the endowment vein more centrally and that can result in some impedance to the flow. Uh, but that I would say is a rare finding. Uh, in such cases, I think a good, uh, if they've, especially if they have symptoms of venous TOS, a reasonable thing to do as a next step would be a CT venogram, MR venogram, or even just a regular venogram. So as a person who's done a good amount of ultrasound in the past and actually did part of my training at Hopkins, so yeah. we may know some of the same sonographers, although it's been a while since I've been there. So it, a couple things to remember, and Emily's bringing up great points. Remember that the blood flow in the artery and the vein are different directions. This is for our viewers. So if you're looking at the venous blood flow, what you actually are often seeing is a reflection of what the heart is doing. So as the right atrium, which receives the blood flow, contracts and squeezes blood into the right ventricle and then the right ventricle squeezes you get these reflections backwards past the clavicle towards the arm and what emily is measuring is that that phasic blood flow it has certain patterns you can see in different diseases but it can change with different arm positions if that vein is compressed and once the phasicity or the waveform flattens out becomes smooth that suggests narrowing up to the point of complete occlusion um Again, by itself, narrowing of the vein does not mean a blood clot, and it doesn't mean a web or a stricture. So it doesn't necessarily mean venous TOS unless you see the blood clot. Now, the artery is a different story, 
the artery, you have blood flow coming from the heart out to the arm. And if you squeeze it, you're seeing the, the waveform after the squeezing point. So instead of eliminating pulses from the heart reaching it, you should be seeing a very distinct arterial pattern that's normal. We know what normal looks like. And once you start narrowing that space, that velocity and waveform can change. It's not worth discussing the technical details. But again, a good sonographer, I'm going to guess that Emily's good because she's asking a really good question. Um, you can look for those uh, small things and, and guess what's happening, even though you can't see the blood vessel under the clavicle. It's completely blind there. But you can guess through logic what's happening really close to where you're scanning. And Emily, I hope between uh, Dr. Lum and I, we've answered your question. And thank you for doing good work. Debbie Pushman, I have bilateral arterial and venous TOS. Do you feel pec minor release is necessary with first rib resection surgery, or is it case by case? Hmm. Tough question, because it really depends on what you mean. And I always ask my patients, what do you mean by arterial and venous TOS? Because um, the chances of having bilateral arterial and venous TOS in general is probably pretty low. Uh, I personally have never seen a patient with bilateral arterial and venous TOS. But if you mean um, compression of the arteries and veins on both sides, and I presume, uh, you know, if you have neurogenic symptoms, then I guess it really depends on where your sensation of pain and tenderness are. I usually only do pec minor releases if they say I'm tender in the pec minor area and they've responded to Botox. Typically, I don't do them concurrently. I do the pec minor releases separate from the first rib resection surgery. Uh, so very rarely I do it at the same time. We do it all through the trans approach. But I, I always feel that the pec minor can be worked with PT and Botox um, uh, injections more than the thoracic outlet can because I think the thoracic outlet, you're dealing with the bands and the scaling bulk and the muscle and the ribs kind of falling into play. Whereas I think for the pec minor, it's usually more of a muscle thing. And so my preference usually is to treat them separately and to work pec minor more with PT and Botox uh, after the rib mm. has been done. Mm. So, but it's controversial. I know there's some surgeons that routinely do it all the time. Okay. And, you know, um, I, I just, I just don't know. I, again, I'm, you know, my conservative uh, approaches to TOS is reflected. Yeah. I, you know, I just do surgery as a last resort. That's great. Thank you. Um, uh, Debbie, I'm going to say, I, I'm going to echo Dr. Lum and say, maybe you want to be careful about the diagnosis here. It sounds exceedingly rare to get bilateral arterial alone, along with bilateral venous. Uh, I've never seen a case like that, and I've seen thousands of these. So just compression by itself, as Dr. Lum was saying, maybe what's happening and maybe uh, the doc who's dealing with this isn't as familiar uh, with the disease. Uh, if you want to consult us, reach out to us through our website, tosmri.com. We can either direct you to somebody good, like Dr. Lum, or we can do a consult with me. But I think you want to firm up this diagnosis. And then I'm going to add something. Uh, in a way that I, I have some bones to pick. I know that's a terrible phrase to use here, but uh, the pectoralis minor syndrome we talk about is classically described as the retropectoralis space is a tunnel where there is compression of these neurovascular bundles. And I do not think that is the case. I think from the literature that I, I know exists of imaging that I don't think the compression occurs. Um, I won't go into great detail, but the neurovascular bundle actually slides to the widest part of that space when you move your arms. And I think it's equally likely that there's tension, too much tension mm -hmm. from the pec minor on the coracoid, which pulls the mm -hmm. scapula down. So things like a tenotomy or a Botox injection to relax that muscle mm -hmm. or remove it uh, have, a, have a beneficial effect, no question about that, but not because it's opening up the space, but because it's allowing repositioning of the scapula. Mm -hmm. um, that I think that's supported by some radiology literature and uh, uh, from the cases that I've seen. Um, it's a whole nother thing. Maybe I'll do a talk on that in the near future. So um, um, my advice is to uh, 
get this reviewed a little more carefully before you take a step towards surgery. Thank you for the good question too. Paradoxal Asium, what is your favorite imaging study for venous TOS workups? I think I'll make Emily happy here by telling us duplex. <laughs> uh, that's, that's usually my first go-to study, duplex. Great. I think that's a great approach. It's readily available. If you have somebody like Dr. Lum who's worked with a sonographer, more than one sonographer, right? All your sonographers do things to your criteria and answer the questions you need answered. Correct. So that's really important. And, and I'll, I always stress this in our talks, teamwork. You know, I talk to surgeons like Dr. Lum all the time, and I, it's awesome for me. I get to learn so much. But hopefully I'm contributing just because um, th this is a tough disease, you know, and it's not low-hanging fruit. So I think for anybody out there who may have TOS or has been diagnosed, having a team that works together, sonographers, physical therapists, surgeons, and other specialists, even radiologists, I think that's where the most value comes for this tough mm -hmm. disease. That's my soapbox. All right. Christopher again. Hi, Christopher. I just looked up TOS physical therapy, and there is a, <laughs> a bunch of crap out there, okay, which is typical for anything related to movement. Can you recommend a YouTube video on physical therapy? Um, I did a, a search not too long ago, and there are some people, some folks out there um, who sound really good. And but they do different things. And number one, I'm not a physical therapist. Uh, I do work with physical therapists and I try to learn from them. Um, my opinion is, I've stated this before on this channel, there are different causes of neurogenic TOS in particular. Dr. Lum showed you samples of ribs he took out, which have all different shapes and sizes. There's anatomic variability here. And so I think there are different syndromes as supported by the literature pointed out before there are 27 different described syndromes before Pete put them all together into one lump thing. But I think it's because there's a lot of variability. Mm -hmm. So I think there are different schools of physical therapy that help. Now, how do you find someone who's good? Um, I, I'm not sure I can answer that. I know some of the people I work with who get good results uh, and we're glad to refer you to somebody like that. But in the Bay area proper, I can think of four really, Steam physical therapists that do four different things. So the, my advice would be to try one physical therapist and see if you get results and be willing to move to a different approach. Mm -hmm. Thoughts on that? I think that's great advice. You know, as we talked about the men, you know, early on, there's no one specific therapy protocol or one specific person that, you know, magically can or one magic exercise that can that can resolve these uh, different bands and the variabilities that you described. So I think that's very spot on. Um, just because it did work once doesn't mean you give up and stop trying again. And I don't think you can do permanent harm from trying no. a physical therapy program. No. All right. Bonkers, donkers. I, I guess, should I call you Mr. Donkers? Or I don't even know if you're Mrs. Donkers. Um, what is your opinion on post-operative venograms? That's a good question. Following first rib resection, is it necessary to improve venous patency? So how do you follow up your people after surgery? So this is a very good question, and it actually touches on some of the controversies in terms of surgical opinion and technique. Um, we typically do our venograms two weeks after surgery on everyone. Now, the reason I do that may is I, because- May I interrupt for one second? I apologize. Yeah. Um, venogram, which the, the samples Dr. Lum showed before, is you inject contrast into a vein like in the elbow or the wrist. And as that contrast flows up the arm, it's either dark or white, depending on your technique, but it stands out from all the other structures so you can see the lining, the internal diameter of that blood vessel, just so people know what we're talking about. Sorry. Yeah, it is great. Um... So I typically do the venograms uh, two weeks after surgery, two to three weeks, it's sometimes four weeks. It doesn't really matter, I don't think. Um, but we do it after because in many of our patients that have complete occlusion, uh, I like to give some time for the decompression to end the patient's own body fibrinolytic system and the anticoagulants to somehow make some channels in that occlusion so that when I do do the venogram, I think I'm more likely to be successful if I wait a couple of weeks as opposed to doing it at the time of surgery. Uh, again, it depends on how acute or fresh or chronic the clot is, um, you know, 
and it's you know it depends on a case by case basis. But for myself, you know, logistics re logistic reasons as well, I tend to just do it all for everyone two to four weeks after surgery, as opposed to doing it at the time of surgery. Now, if someone is widely open or maybe has minimal um, compression. Uh, I guess you could potentially do it at the same time of surgery. Uh, if you have, you know, you're in the right room, you have to be in a hybrid room or you know, have the appropriate equipment at the time of your surgery to do all that too. So there are logistics and also medical reasons as to why someone may do the videogram uh, after mm -hmm. surgery. Now, if we know that your vein is completely widely open uh, because your thermolysis was 100% successful and the ultrasound showed no evidence of blood clots, and you were doing this only to prevent the chance of a recurrent clot, there are times I don't even do a venogram because, you know, there's nothing, you know, you know the veins can be wide open. Um, but sometimes, and most of the, you know, I would say most of the majority of the time, there's going to be some degree of stenosis left behind just because the mm -hmm. sinique and all the stuff on the inside is still not quite perfect. And in that case, I tend to do the venogram and the venoplasty with the balloon to stretch out and, and uh, take the balloon out. Mm -hmm just to improve venous patency long run. And when you do the balloon angioplasty, you're injecting dye. Correct. To see where the narrowing is, then you place the balloon, then you crack it, yep. and then you inject some more dye to make sure it looks good. Yep. So you have a reference point there that you know that's what you're talking. Correct. Just for the patients who don't know all the steps. So you yeah. know it's patent when you pull that balloon catheter out. So some surgeons will do a venogram right after they do the surgery. Is that correct? Correct. Some some surgeons do it at the same time as the surgery, and it's totally fine to do that. Right. But there are going to be changes over the next couple of weeks to a month. Yeah, I think it depends on how the vein is. You know, the vein was wide open to begin with. It's not going to change much. If there was complete occlusion, there's a good chance that the vein may recanalize in the time that you're taking the rib out and put them on anticoagulation and allow the body's fibrinolytic, mm -hmm. anti-fibrinolytic system to kind of kick in. So um, that's why I ch generally tend to wait two to four weeks. Um, before I do a venogram. Right. And if they've done well after surgery, no recurrent symptoms, obviously your yield is going to be pretty low to find a new blood clot there. Mm -hmm. Yep. Great. Thank you. All right. X7 Ream. If you have bilateral TOS but only had surgery on one side, would the non surgical side cause the surgical side to still have symptoms? Um, I'm not sure we're talking about neurogenic here. Maybe you can clarify for us. The non-surgical side counts. I, I, you know, usually the extreme TOS usually causes unilateral symptoms. So if I got right-sided TOS, I would have right-sided symptoms. Uh, you may have left-sided compression, like you know, Dr. Worden and I have mentioned, could be incidental. But typically, I wouldn't say left TOS causing right-sided symptoms. Yeah, we have we have some patients from the neurogenic ones I work with and follow. Um, some, I, I tend to find symmetry. If they have compression of the plexus on one side, they tend to have it to a similar degree on the other on imaging. Um, sometimes even if they don't have many symptoms on the opposite side or no symptoms, they get surgery on mm -hmm. the symptomatic side and then they start noticing stuff on the other side. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I don't know why just reasonable guesses are they have a healthier lifestyle with more exertion now because they've relieved a lot of the pain. And so they're stressing the other side mm -hmm. or they might be changing their posture because they're not guarding anymore by holding their shoulder. We, we don't know, but mm -hmm. that does happen with some regularity for neurogenic. Mm -hmm. I also think, you know, in the, the instance that what you described, sometimes the symptoms are so dominant on one side that once mm -hmm. that one side gets treated, it kind of unmasks what you thought was minimal on the other side. So right. it's hard to know whether it's always been the same intensity or if now it becomes more apparent because your other side has been treated uh, I think all those things are all possible. That's a great point. I hope we answered your question. Thank you. Brian Mack, can atypical compression occur from other sources? Uh, for example, cervical lymph nodes, anomalous course of a small vein or artery, or a fibrous band? Great question. So our sonographers have picked up incidental thyroid cancers. Uh, I've diagnosed breast cancer. I've diagnosed lymphomas um, and, you know, just a couple of other different disorders, you know, for patients that come in to see me uh, for the consultation for TOS. And when they do the ultrasound, they find all these lymph nodes, uh, masses and things like that. So um, 
I, I you know I think that's why it's important important to have good communication with your sonographer because they let you know right away and you know it's, sometimes it's tough um, to deliver news like that telling someone you may have some sort of cancer and not TOS you know um, but that's happened before. That's great if a sonographer finds totally incidental mm -hmm. asymptomatic cancer. That's I know it doesn't sound good, but that's actually good luck that mm -hmm. it was found before it became big enough to create symptoms. Um, I, I don't know if you're asking, if we could go back one question, Herb. I don't know if you're asking about structures that can compress the veins, but um, all right, I'll address that later. So Emily asked again, uh, thank you, Dr. Worden and Dr. Lum. Uh, I'm going to follow this channel and share. Thank you, Emily. Um, I know this info can be beneficial as some techs can struggle understanding TOS examinations. I personally love these exams. I knew you would say that. You obviously have put a lot into them and it's uh, really rewarding when you help patients out. A lot of these patients, as Dr. Lum said, there's plenty of places in this country people just don't even look for TOS. So when we have um, an expert in something like a great sonographer who can help find it, that's my opinion, tremendously valuable. Now, I, I, I have tons of experience with patients who were not diagnosed by a doctor until someone like you said to the patient, go ask your doctor about TOS. So I think that's great. Keep doing good work. And yeah, if you want to talk with us, if you want to do one of these talks with us and you can teach people about what you do, we love to educate patients. So reach out through my website and contact us. We'd love to chat with you. Debbie, I am Canadian. We have a very hard time with TOS. Mm. Do you, Dr. Alum, do virtual consultations for Canadians? Uh, I actually do not do virtual consultations for international patients just because, you know, their licensing regulation stuff. And, you know, as Dr. Wooden mentioned, uh, I can't give you medical advice in such a circumstance, that, you know, medical opinions. These are just advice, right, or that we can suggest or directions of where you can approach. You know, whatever I say today on such forums should not be considered as medical um medical advice so uh, i i think you should look up the tos awareness website i think um there are some forums or websites where they actually list down surgeons in different countries around the world uh that um have specialists you know that you know you can see so i think it's more difficult finding the specialists, but I think these websites have helped identify the specialists can, that can help you in those countries, including Canada. But having been at Hopkins, I know that they get a lot of international travelers. Mm -hmm. So if somebody wanted to visit you from Canada and go through your triage team, they would yep. be able to make an appointment to see you. Correct. Yep. Uh, also, Debbie, you can contact us again through our website and we can steer you to um, people around the country who do virtual consultations. Uh, I will say this, it is somewhat limited without the physical exam, but I know we've had several patients from Canada and it is challenging there for a few reasons. So don't waste time. Let us help you at least get a, a start on this. Thanks, Debbie. Um, also, I, I always say this about websites. Um, you know, we had somebody just ask a little while ago about physical therapists and finding some uh, not so great advice. Uh, we always encourage our people to take somebody who's very deliberate, like Dr. Lum, who says, you know, look, I can go so far, but I can't diagnose you this way. There are also people out there who are non-medical who do the opposite and say, you should listen to me. Um, a website, social media forum, or sources for information, but really sources for finding the authoritative information. They are not by themselves mm -hmm. authoritative information unless they're run by a specialist, a doctor. And, um, the internet is great. Dr. Google is great, but uh, be judicious and get more than one opinion. Don't just go through social media because somebody said, uh, you know, I, I had frog toxin rubbed between my first and second finger and it worked. So be careful. Okay. And we can connect you with plenty of doctors who can help you. All right, Herb, do we have more questions? We've, we've been through so many here and I'm thankful for people participating so much. Um, Oh, you know, Emily asked a question here I see in the comments. Uh, how do you feel about venous stenting status post rib resection if there are still persistent clots requiring thrombectomy? Um, so I've personally never placed a stent myself uh, for venous TOS, but I've taken care of and still taking care of many patients who've had stents. Uh, I've seen one or two disasters um, and really bad outcomes complicated by the stents. 
Um, so typically, I'm not a fan of placing uh, Venus stents. And again, you know, I don't think you need to have 100% patency in the vein. Uh, anywhere between 30 and 50% patency, I think, is more than sufficient in draining the arm and for patients not to have significant venous congestion symptoms. So I'm more likely to recommend a bypass before a stent, um, but, you know, I, I don't think everyone needs a stent. And, and just so people know, if they don't know already, stent is a metal cage that you put over a balloon and you expand it. It's supposed to keep a vein open. But if there is extrinsic compression, like the clavicle and rib are too close, It'll just squash that cage. So it's not an answer by itself. Um, look, I, I've taken a lot of your time. It's been awesome to hear, you know, how much you know about TOS and hear about your approach and especially your thoughtfulness and your care in approaching what you know definitively and what we don't know yet. So I got to thank you so much for spending your time with us. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Dr. Uh, people can reach out to Dr. Lum and his team, as you see below. I'll remind people, please hit the like button. Please subscribe and hit the bell. We want to spread this word and we can do that through social media. We appreciate it. You can also find us on Instagram, uh, Twitter, uh, TOSMRI. Just look for us. Uh, a website very closely related to us is TOSeducation.org. And that has a lot of our upcoming events listed. Um, thank you again. Remember, I'm Dr. Scott Worden, the TOS guy. And uh, contact us with any questions. We're glad to help. And finally, thanks again for Dr. Lum who's great at this, and we really appreciate his efforts. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye.